welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Today, I want to take a look at the work of creator Sam Keith. I think Sam Keith is probably the single comic book creator that I've received the most overall requests to analyze and discuss, but he's proven to be an elusive subject for me because compared to a lot of his contemporaries, there's not quite as many interviews by him out there, and he's taken some sort of confusing sabbaticals from the comic book industry from time to time. But I've definitely assembled enough of a narrative and I definitely have strong opinions on his work. Sam Keith has an art style that's utterly unique. He's worked for all of the major comic book publishers, and yet his artwork is decidedly not mainstream. So we're going to take a look at someone with some extreme highs and lows over their career, some self-deprecating humor on Sam's part, and also some fairly awkward history. Please consider hitting like and subscribe, and without any further ado, Let's get into it. Born in January of 1963, Sam Keith broke into comics in 1984 at Comico, thanks to an unlikely meeting at the 1983 San Diego Comic-Con. Waiting in line to potentially see Harvey Kurtzman, Sam met writer William Messner Loeb's, who was three issues into his indie title, Journey, The Adventures of Wolverine McAllister, and the two struck up a friendship. Mester Loeb's soon had Keith draw a backup story in Journey about Keith's journey to acquire that comic's back issues. Keith was looking to become an illustrator, and Mester Loeb's recommended him to Comico to hire as an inker on Matt Wagner's book Mage. Keith had some art featured in Comico Primer issue 5 in 1983, but broke informally as an inker on issues 6 through 15 of Mage, keeping him busy through 1986. You can see the change in artwork between issues 5 and 6. Wagner's inks on his own pencils feature pretty thick lines and plenty of dark shadows. Backgrounds in the early issues are sparse, often using patterns instead. Once Keith begins inking, the line work becomes smooth and flowing. He exaggerates feet and eyes in a way that readers of Keith's later work will recognize. Opaque glasses and squinting eyes. Keith also adds dirty and believable backgrounds, especially alleyways. Sam Keith also inked Fish Police thanks to the contacts he was making at Comico. In 1987, he illustrated issues 6 through 8 of Adolescent Radioactive Black Belt Hamsters through publisher Eclipse, where he met writer Don Chin as well as another artist working on the title, Mike Dringenberg. This early illustration work is not as exaggerated as some of Keith's later work, but can still show off his use of deep shadows, innovative panel structure, and heavy use of background silhouettes. Issue 7's cover compares favorably with Sam Keith's later work on characters like Wolverine or The Max, hulking shapes, speed lines, a humongous round shape for a massive back, and more body hair than you'll find at a nudist beach party. Also, all of these early contacts that Keith made would return to collaborate with him later in his career. He had one opportunity to ink a book for DC Comics in 1988 that did not go well. He did fill in work for Infinity Incorporated number 49 for writer Roy Thomas. In an interview with Sequential Tart, Keith spoke about that experience saying, quote, in between those were years of doing books that were bad or were bad introductions, such as the first inking job I did for DC. The editor and writer of the book, Roy Thomas, called me up and basically said, Kid, you're bad. You'll never work in comics again, and you need to quit while you're behind. Sam Keith's work thus far was mostly for indies, but he was consistent and he was apparently easy to work with, so it put him on the radar of DC Comics editor Karen Berger. So in 1988, when she approved Neil Gaiman's pitch for a Sandman series, she actually recommended that he consider Sam Keith to be the artist. It was a huge opportunity to move his career forward, and Sam Keith hated it. Sandman is a critically acclaimed bestseller now, but back in 1988, Neil Gaiman and Sam Keith had not had a regular monthly series for a mainstream publisher yet. Sandman is the story of Morpheus, the Lord of Dream. The comic begins when some occultists trap him, 
for almost a century. He finally gets free at the beginning of the comic run and sets about both correcting the problems with dreams and nightmares while he was away, as well as rectifying his own past mistakes. It's a book that mixes horror, drama, and comedy in equal measure. The esoteric story sounds right for Sam Keith on paper, but he did not have a good time and never felt like he fit in. In an interview with the website Suicide Girls, Keith said he wanted to use mixed media for the comic, but he wasn't allowed to. He said, quote, I would ask the editor if I could paint the panels, then go back in and do the line art. She said, no, that would be too expensive. This, despite the fact that the book was using artist Dave McKean's surreal mixed media for all of its covers. Even though he only stayed on the title for five issues, he was miserable, as he put it in an interview with Sequential Tart. He told Digital Spy that, quote, I was very embarrassed by my drawing skills at the time, and my issues are a very public way to be reminded of that. Keith spoke about it more to Suicide Girls, saying, quote, it's funny to talk about this because at the time, all I could do was think about how I wanted to be drawing any other book but that one. Because I didn't like my art on it, and I was fighting with the editor really hard. She would say, I'm thinking about whether to fire you today. I would think, yes, yes, yes. Gaiman tried to cater to Sam Keith's art style, even writing whole issues that were set in hell, just so that uh, Sam Keith could work on the stuff that he excelled at, weird monsters. But it just wasn't a good fit. Sam Keith did not enjoy working on that title. And I think when you look at it, you can kind of tell. There just isn't the same amount of overall detail as you often see in books that he's obviously passionate about. It's not that it's bad artwork, it's just that you can sort of tell that he's not passionate about it. But the one good thing to happen about it was that he brought in artist Mike Dringenberg as his inker. Except he instantly felt that it should be the other way around, that Dringenberg should be the artist and that Sam Keith should be inking his work. Dringenberg did become the illustrator once uh, Sam Keith stepped down, and he famously helped co-create Death, which was famously based on Dringenberg's friend Cinnamon Hadley. 1989 was a busy year for Sam Keith. He finished his fifth issue of Sandman and also illustrated Epicurus the Sage for writer William Messner Lobes, their first real collaboration. It was published by DC Comics' Piranha Press and allowed Keith to indulge in more cartoony figures and exaggerated physiques. Looking at the work in the book, I'm pretty sure I see influences like Frank Frazetta and Bernie Wrightson. There's a similarity in how Keith approaches using shadows on musculature to those artists. He mixes both a classic artist's approach to anatomy with a cartoonist's eye to exaggeration. In 1989, Keith also submitted a pinup of Freddy Krueger to Marvel's short-lived magazine celebrating the famous movie slasher, and Marvel wanted Keith to draw an ongoing comic with writer Peter David at the helm. But Keith said he felt he'd never be able to keep up drawing in a similarly detailed way on a monthly book, and he was glad when it ultimately fell apart. Nevertheless, Peter David had Keith draw a fill-in issue of his Incredible Hulk run, issue 368. The Hulk was a great fit for Sam Keith. The regular artist was Dale Keown, who drew a very unique and detailed Hulk. He specialized in some of the same deep shadows, round, flowing line work, and textural detail that Sam Keith used. The Hulk issue allowed Keith to dive into details like rippling muscles, pulsing veins, absurd facial features, and shredded clothing. There's an attention to detail that had not been seen in his previous work, but which was absolutely becoming popular in early 90s comics. Fans loved the fine detail of artists like Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee. Keith's work could be less grounded than theirs most of the time, but it certainly had an energy to it that was comparable. The Hulk work led to Keith working on many issues of 1990s Marvel Comics Presents, both on covers and interiors. A lot of those stories were for Wolverine. Keith likes drawing strong guys, but also likes drawing short people with big feet and body hair. Wolverine was perfect. He worked on most issues between 85 and 122, and his goal was to be called up to be the regular artist on the solo Wolverine title. 
When that didn't happen, Keith was disillusioned and more than happy to abandon Marvel when Image Comics invited him to join them in 1993. Image Comics was the biggest thing to happen to comics in 1992. Superstars like Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, Eric Larson, Mark Silvestri all left Marvel at the height of their careers to found their own publishing company where creators would own what they created. And so it was also a similarly big deal when in 1993 those founders invited a select few creators to publish their own creator-owned works through Image. That included a select few like Dale Keown's Pitt and Sam Keith's The Max. If you're already familiar with Sam Keith, you most likely know him from his 35 issues of The Max that he published through Image. Once again, Keith brought in an old friend to collaborate, hiring William Messner Loebs to script the book through issue 23, with Alan Moore guesting for issue 21. We've already delved into what makes Sam Keith's artwork unique, and he was clearly excited and engaged with this book, giving it as much detail as anything he'd worked on. But it shows some growth, too. While some of the book is exaggerated, a lot of it is also pretty realistic. Fortunately, Keith has a story that plays to those strengths. The Max is not really the story of the big purple superhero with the weird teeth and yellow claws. It's the story of Julie Winters, a social worker helping the Max, who is homeless and has mental issues. However, he is able to see a dreamlike world called the Outback, where Julie is a jungle goddess, at least in the Max's eyes. The Max can traverse between these realities as can villain Mr. Gone. The book eventually delves into what makes Julie tick and analyzes her emotional traumas. All of Sam Keith's stories that he created moving forward would be female-centric and deal with trauma, both physical and mental. And let's be clear, YouTube hates it when words like this are mentioned, but Julie is dealing with having been raped. That's some dark material, darker than you might expect by looking at the cover of a purple superhero being published alongside books like Wildcats. The Max himself is homeless, and scripter William Messner Loebs would later deal with a bout of homelessness himself. Keith and Messner Loebs were drawing from some very serious problems and putting that into The Max. The Max is a sprawling story with many layers to its reality. And to truly analyze that comic would really require an episode of its own, and I'd have to really spoil everything to properly contextualize the characters. So um, today I'm just going to move forward and talk about other aspects of Sam Keith's career. What I will say is the artwork is always engaging. I loved it in the 90s when I read it, and rereading it now, it holds up surprisingly well. Now, ironically, Sam Keith hit a lot of success with this book, and it led to him taking a detour from comics overall. In 1995, The Max was adapted into an animated show on MTV. This introduced Sam Keith to Hollywood, and he networked into directing a Roger Corman-produced film called Take It to the Limit. To put it mildly, it was not well-received. This took Keith a couple of years to make, and when it bombed, it seems to have hurt him. He fell out of the public eye and didn't really return to comics until 2001. And when he returned, he delivered his most personal comic yet, with a character based very much on himself, although gender-swapped. This was Zero Girl, which came out from Homage, Jim Lee's imprint, which at that point was published by DC Comics. I always try to be honest with my opinions on this channel, and I will say that I liked Sam Keith's artwork at Marvel and on the Max very, very much. Uh, I even like his work on The Sandman. I don't necessarily think it's his top tier work, but I do think it's still very good and engaging. Um, when it comes to Zero Girl, I would say that his artwork has evolved and it looks good. The artwork is good, but the story itself I find very disturbing and I can't get into it very much. Zero Girl is a five-issue series following 15-year-old Amy Smoothster in high school. When she gets embarrassed, her feet leak a strange liquid, which must be some sort of a metaphor for girls going through puberty. Anything circular protects Amy and defends her, 
while square things are her enemies. Some girls bully her because the hunky school guidance counselor seems to like Amy. It builds up until the main bully goes on a killing rampage. Let me jump back and reiterate. This is the story of a 15-year-old girl and the adult who is crushing on her. Nothing is consummated, but it's a bit icky. Keith has spoken in many interviews about how this is partially based on his life. When he was 15, he began living with the woman who eventually became his wife, and who was 20 years older. It's nice to know that they're still together, but it was also illegal. Yet the comic tries to romanticize the age difference, and the characters go to some extent to justify things. The comic story is mitigated by the fact that the characters don't end up together. But it's still a very inappropriate relationship. Even if you set aside the age difference, the teacher is in a position of authority. It's an abuse of power to even entertain the thought of being in a relationship with someone who cannot legally give consent. His next book was also from a female point of view and published through DC. This was Four Women, the story of four friends on a road trip. They are attacked by some bikers and one of them is locked outside to protect the other three. The main character struggles with the trauma of what she did to her best friend out of fear and how she can reconcile with this friend. It's a challenging story, but I would argue this one is told from a fairly objective point of view. It's emotionally tough, but honest. This also came from a story Keith drew from real life where his wife was approached at knife point, and they talked about how she would have been willing to lock a friend out of the car to protect herself in that moment. After that, Keith again took a few years off from comics before returning with Ojo and My Inner Bimbo in 2004 through 2008, two parts of what is intended to be a trilogy of stories. The first story is a bit of horror as Annie and her older sister deal with the death of their mother. Annie's sister becomes a bit of an aggressive bully while Annie works to take care of animals, but each pet she adopts ends up dying until she comes across a giant monster in a sewer that she names Ojo. The dead animals come from Keith's life. In a 2011 interview with Comic Attack, Keith opened up and explained that he'd lost pets, including a Chinese water dragon whose jaw broke, and also a fairly horrific tale where he put some frogs in a zipper pocket and his mother washed the clothes, leading to, quote, all this gooey stuff. Ojo is black and white, and allows you to experience Keith's artwork on a more visceral level. The sequel, however, follows a man named Lo married to a woman 17 years older than him. I already went through this with Zero Girl, and it just doesn't connect with me. I suppose what I can say is that I find Sam Keith inconsistent. Even at the height of his popularity in the 90s, he was doing some covers for Batman, and some of them were not the strongest. They could look rushed. It seems like Keith's work is stronger the more passionate he is about something. Since 2006 and going to as recently as 2018, Sam Keith has also illustrated a number of very fun Batman limited series. These Batman stories may not be as emotionally complex as some of the female-centric stories that he himself created. However, the artwork is an evolution of his style and features a lot of detail and energy. Anyone that was a fan of Sam Keith in the 90s would definitely have fun reading his more recent Batman work. Me saying that Sam Keith is inconsistent is not necessarily a knock against him because even if I don't like something, that doesn't mean that you won't. Some people will like things that I don't, and that's fine. Some of his stories don't connect with me, but the artwork, I always like. I always appreciate and am engaged with Sam Keith's artwork. It's utterly unique. There's nothing else quite like it. The closest comparisons I can come up with are the ways that somebody like Bernie Wrightson may shade a character, but then that's mixed with something surreal like, say, early Basil Wolverton. And it just creates a product that's 100% unique and one that I appreciate and I never get tired of seeing. When you see some Sam Keith artwork on the shelves, you know that it's Sam Keith and no one else. And that's very cool. It's always fun to find something new and original in comics. Thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna be back real soon. And until then, keep reading comics.
Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.